big city that's too big to get your arms around and you are just one small speck on the corner of a building overlooking it. I think scale is an important part of, of that form of fiction. It's also why, that, oh, why I think that... Sorry, sorry, Will, but uh, it's, it's why I think that the, the more cosmic, high-level superhero stories are actually much more realistic than Batman. Batman just couldn't happen. You know, Christopher Nolan gets kind of near it where Batman's almost crippled in the last one, but he can still fight this super wrestler being. <laughs> which they're still capable of that, but the real truth is that Batman would work for a week and his knees would be fucked and he'd be cemented <laughs> <laughs> and he'd have taken too much gas. He'd be, you know, he'd be a mess instantly. It can't happen. But Superman, yeah, maybe somebody could suddenly arrive from another planet that just happens to absorb sunlight. So I kind of, <laughs> I kind of believe that those, those things are more believable for me, but also within our heads, I think that the, the, the battles that we fight out in our heads daily are cosmic battles, you know, the existential fears that we deal with constantly, the, the thoughts that we all go through, love, death, guilt, loss, your mum's died, your dad's died. These are what superhero stories are best at talking about because they, they translate them directly into symbols and that's why I love them and the realistic stuff to me is ridiculous. I mean, I'm too literal. There can't be a realistic superhero like that guy. Phoenix Jones and you know it's it's bullshit, but there can be metaphorical superheroes and symbolic superheroes because in our own lives we're all fighting cosmic forces and we'll all fight the ultimate enemy one day on a bed, you know. So I think they work best on that level and, and I think that's where the scale is important because the scale of our own tiny experience is epic and universal. Well you would Yeah, I really like what Warren's saying about the um the fact that even with, with Batman, you've got someone with a certain power level, but he's still on a certain scale compared to the city, and the Fantastic Four are equally small compared to the cosmos. But an interesting thing about Batman, and other characters like Daredevil, is sometimes they're pitted against a much bigger scale. I mean, Grant's JLA, one of the most interesting things is where Batman mixes with these meta-human characters. He's mixing with the fastest man alive, Amazon, a Kryptonian, the man with the most powerful weapon in the universe, and he actually, in the first storyline, he, he beats them through his, uh, his cunning. He, he's the one who realised the white Martians are Martians and uh, are vulnerable to fire. The whole thing about the way Batman can work with the Justice League is because we understand he has files and all of their weaknesses, and if he wants, he can you know, disrupt Green Lantern's thinking and totally disable his ring. Also, in Frank Miller's um, Daredevil, there's, um, I can't remember exactly which one it is, but he comes up at one point against Iron Man and Captain Avenger and the rest of the uh, Captain America and the rest of the Avengers. I, I like the way you have these kind of power levels, you know, people are totally outclassed and sometimes they can really step up. You've got these characters who are much more obviously accessible viewpoint characters for us because they're basically human. <clears throat> and I find it quite aspirational and uh, inspirational the way those people can walk among basically demigods. <coughs> well, the, the Batman thing, I mean, in Grunt's JLA, the Batman thing, thing felt different to me. Um, Batman was placed in the role of the trickster. Mm. The trickster god is always the least physically powerful in any pantheon he, appear, he or she appears in. Um, but they always have the edge. The, the, the daredevil thing, yeah, that, that was always a, a bit odd. Um, I was throwing up another team which exists in that universe that you've got these incredible powerful characters who can juggle planets and, mm. and the characters who can lift up a truck. Right. And then uh, Ant Man. <laughs> <laughs> Not coming to a cinema near <laughs> But it's a charming oddity, I think, that you've got these various degrees of strength mm. between people who can fight Galactus. Well, again, when you see them purely government. as just metaphors and it's easy, it just means, oh, the smallest part of me can somehow find a moment where it stands yeah, up. Yeah, it, it, it's that the, the human part of me can be the thing that saves the day today. Well, you've got that man oh. shooting dark side. Yeah, of course, because you know, it had to be, isn't it? You're actually facing off against a god, using a gun for once, and oh, going back Because in your head, that's what it feels like to go up against mm -hmm. depression and or grief and or... And with some of these characters, it's the masking effect, like uh, characters like Spider-Man or Daredevil who have something you can relate to that is very human. They are you in that story when they're placed uh, into a very esoteric setting, like, I don't know, Spider-Man fighting someone in the moon or whatever. Um, is that is that masking effect that allows you to if you if that if you allow that character to represent you, then they represent you in that and that's why I love those, the Jim Starlin cosmic comics in the seventies. <laughs> and Starlin would just do direct confrontations with you know here comes a representation of your self doubt, mm. and then Captain Marvel would kick fuck out of it. <laughs> <laughs> By the 
end up, oh, self doubt, fuck you. <laughs> Spiraling yeah. into the depressive Adam Warlock thing. That, that yeah, did, it, was that, it was done and again, it was Adam Warlock. Um, and did the same thing. Here's, here, you, now you get to fight death, you get to write, fight uh, the, the embodiment of suicide. That happened. But afterwards, it'd always be Adam Warlock on his own saying, I've won, but it's driven me completely mad. <laughs> uh, and until by the end of it, he was just this shambling wreck who welcomed death. <laughs> 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 Do they have to be wish fulfillment, or do they work best when they're wish fulfillment? Because there's this whole sort of thing that you know we we've talked about a bit about how superheroes in the sort of you know 80s, 90s suddenly it was all oh, it's dark. They're all damaged. Um, is there a sort of limit how far you can go down that road I, I, before it comes to I, I think um, if you replace wish fulfillment with, with a word like processing, because mm. it's something slightly larger, because it it can be. Um, experience of fantasy and, and working out through the fiction. But as Grant says, it could also be uh, a masking effect that allows you to deal with depression or allows you to deal with whatever pressures are going on in your life, emotional uh, as well as uh, physically instantiated. Um, it, it, it's, this kind of fiction uh, enables a kind of processing uh, of feelings and travels uh, above and beyond, I think, simple wish fulfillment of I wish I had large muscles and could beat the fuck out of I think it just has to be you know? honest, really, in all of it. If the work is honest, whether it's fantastical or whether it's really grounded, if it's honest and it's genuinely talking about feelings or processes mm. that the writer or the artist has gone through and it can be communicated to people using these symbols, then that's it. You know, it can be, it can be a dystopian story or a utopian story, but as long as it, it tells the truth, I think that's what makes it important. And it's why the best ones still retain the power. Is it more, I mean, is there something more satisfying about working on your own characters as opposed to, I mean, you know, your own characters you created? Or, I mean, I've, Warren, I mean, you used the phrase, I think I interviewed on stage once, you said, the thing is, the big <coughs> superhero franchise is a kind of corporate owned mythology. Yes. Do, um, I don't think shortly after that I saw you'd signed up for another. Uh, run of the Avengers. Um, <laughs> do you, they do give you coins. They do give you coins. <laughs> they do that, yes. But, but oh, yes, they have their uses. <laughs> they do. Are, they, are the corporate mythologies limiting? Or, I mean, uh, maybe you've got a slightly different take on this. Um, um, th there are inherent limits to the material. Um, and you know, going in, there are limits to how you present them. Uh, beyond that, I mean, not a whole hell of a lot. To be honest, I mean, an issue of Moon Knight I did just came out um, that, that's mostly uh, a mushroom derived hallucination uh, <laughs> happening inside the brain of a dead man with fungus growing on his brain matter. Um, they, I they, like that. Yeah, <laughs> they, uh, we're, uh, <laughs> we've all yeah. been there, haven't we? <laughs> You see, you see, I'm writing about the ground to earth grounded things that we have to process in the same <laughs> um, that, that, that There are really limits in, in those terms. Well, following um, a bit nicer though, you couldn't do that with Batman and Superman, could you? I don't know. Um, I th there may have been a space where you could, to be honest. Really? Maybe. <laughs> there might have been a space yeah, there. There's still an else world. Possibly, but yeah. again, it might not be. Here. He's available for hire. Yeah. It <laughs> may not be necessary because we got. Apollo mm -hmm. in the middle, right, right. you know, which was yeah, able they're, they're to like express that. Yeah, they're in their own universe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, um, the, the, these corporations they do change character. They're not one. Uh, they don't present one monolithic personality for the, their entire existence. There are times where there are good places. There are good places to work, and there are times where there are bad places to work. There are times where they will let you play with their toys more freely, or they will stand over you and tell you exactly how you are to play with their toys. Um, so it shifts. I mean, right now, DC is certainly not at the point, I don't think, where there'd be an alternative no. Batman Superman story where uh, <laughs> they were in a stable gay relationship. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there have been times where you probably could have done something similar. And I've always found I've never been edited, my work hasn't been changed. I know the rules going in, so I know what I'm playing with, I know how to bend it all. Except for Madonna outfit. Apart from Madonna outfit, but that was early on in, in my career with DC, and it kind of, it, it wasn't a make or break one, and it wasn't anything in the writing, you know, it was just, it was a, it was a visual idea, so, to be honest, I've never had problems, and I found that it's easy to take corporate characters and turn them into mouthpieces for your own insanity. <laughs> <laughs> 
speaking about the pieces, there might be some in the audience. Um, <laughs> would anybody out there who's suffering from a uh, post-mortem mushroom hallucination like to kick off the questioning? Um, there are going to be microphones coming around, so if you, particularly the gentleman just here to start with, please wait for the mics. Um, <clears throat> That's a really chilling way. Anyone else? <laughs> 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 oh my God! the <laughs> 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 the first issue of 2018 I saw was the exact one that you you had up on the screen, and, and Zenith was the first character that I saw in 2008 that completely blew my mind. Um, <clears throat> but at what point in your creative process do you stop and look at your work and go, "Well, bugger me, this is really good," and then you want to share it with other people? I guess I always, that's the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a little kid, I mean, honestly, I wanted to be a writer from the age of five. My mother gave me an Enid Blyton book called, uh, the, what was it, The Ringo Bells Mystery? And this thing blew me away, the idea that you could write stuff down. And the fact that I could sit there and become absorbed in this entire universe between these people was really like, what the fuck, this is amazing. So, I don't think anyone finishes a piece of work yeah. and says, well, that's shit, but I suppose I can no. send it to them anyway. <laughs> exactly, I mean, no one, no one ever phones it in, or maybe some people do, I don't know, but certainly that, that idea of phoning it in, apart from the fact that we all phone it in via the internet, <laughs> is uh, <laughs> it just, most of the time you sit there and you try to do your best thing, and some of them just obviously aren't the best, some of them are much better than others, but no one, I don't think anyone goes yes, into it. I always describe it as the best available me that day. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. So no, I, don't, I always kind of, I guess I wouldn't have tried to get published if I didn't think it was good enough to be published. But again, you still have doubts until, I'm sure still you, uh, until you die as a writer or any creative person wonders why the hell it's working. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just in the front here. Um, superheroes aside, um, spirituality has been important in your writing, uh, Grant in particular, and uh, sort of occult thinking and philosophy and magic. And I'm just interested why that's something uh, that you put into your comics and how powerful you think the medium is, um, in particular, to communicate those messages. Oh God. Uh, well, I got, I got into magic when I was 19, and my Uncle Billy gave me a, a Crowley tarot deck and the, the Book of Thought that accompanied it. So he, he did this fantastic occult library and he was kind of uh, in all that stuff. So I was always interested, but at 19 I was, I was kind of going nowhere. I'd just been rejected from art school and I, you know, I was living with my parents. I had no girlfriend. It was really fucking horrible. <laughs> so I thought something has to work here. And I, I discovered magic. I discovered Crowley and, and particularly chaos magic, which was happening at the time. And there was a fanzine called The, the Lamp of Thought that was being published from Leeds. And these guys were introducing this whole the ideas of chaos, which were basically to update magic. And it felt like punk magic to me. It was the notion that you could build your own rituals and your own symbol systems out of things that were potent to you, rather than retreating to the symbols of the past or you know of, of ancient pantheons or whatever. So I guess I got into it in that level, and only later did I realise that the comics were part of that. When I first when I was writing Zenith, there was a lot of magical references in it, but they were kind of, you know, annotations. But by the time I got to something like Flex Mentalo, say, I was starting to think, how can you actually do magic using this medium? Because obviously a lot of magic in, in the past had been done via visual media, where, you know, the, the hunters would paint bison in the walls of their caves and draw spears going into them, allegedly, so science tells us at the moment. And this would provoke bison to run into the paths of their spears. So I kind of figured, well, could I do comics to make things happen in my life and in the world? And, and it, that's that's the, the super short, because I could go, I'd go on about this all night, and there's a lot of other stuff to talk about. But it's, fast forward to the collapse land. Yeah, fast forward <laughs> to the collapse yeah. land. So yeah, so like, as Warren says, when I got it, but I started doing the invisibles, and it became, I thought, I'll really treat this as a magical work, and I'll shave my head, and I'll change places with the main character, in the sense that I went to if he was in Australia, I would go to Australia. If he was doing a bungee jump, I would go do a bungee jump. If he was taking a particular drug, I would take the drug. If he was going out with a girl, I would find the girl. So I was kind of trying to exchange my life with this character. Then made the mistake of giving him a collapsed lung and he's tortured in a, a dentist chair by madmen. And within, you know, he basically told there's a, a virus eating his face. Within three months, I've got a virus eating my face. The scar is still there. I was in hospital with collapsed lung 